Welcome to Blended by McGraw-Hill. Welcome to Blended, the podcast from McGraw-Hill. Uh, I'm really excited today to be joined by Dominic Lukes, who is from the Centre for Teaching and Learning at the University of Oxford. And today we're going to have a, a conversation and a chat about chat GPT, the hot button topic of the moment, and where it's come from, where it's going and what the impact is. So uh, Dominic, welcome. Thanks very much for, for agreeing to join us today. Thank you, Wes. And hello, uh, everybody. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So I guess let's 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 jump in by by going back to the basics. Really, there's there's a lot of buzz around ChatGPT in particular, but sort of the, the general use of, of of AI in education and how that works. But um, how did we get to this point with ChatGPT? I really want to sort of strip that back down so that we understand the fundamentals of what it is, how does it work, and and, and, and from your perspective. Yes. Uh, well. Well, this has been a long journey in many ways, and it's uh, what the biggest splash that ChatGTB has made was was this strange chat interface, the the sort of uh, the chatbot aspect of it. But that's uh, the new thing. That's the new thing that made it so popular with everybody. But in fact, what matters is the GPT part that's under the hood, and that which is come, what gives us some of that, those exciting capabilities. But the chat part isn't insignificant. That gives us some important aspects as well. So I thought maybe if we deconstruct that name a little bit, that might give us a little bit about what it is and also how it's come about. And uh, maybe the best place to start is the most enigmatic, which is the T at the end. We start from the T, which stands for transformers. And this is relatively new technology that was introduced in um, an academic paper by Google in 2017. It was called Attention is All You Need. And that may seem very sort of very technical and everything, but the word attention is very essential here because up until then, we've been looking at, uh, at text, AI, and text processing in a way that was, look, that was trying to do too many things at once. And what these engineers at Google have tried to do when, when they're looking at translation machines is say, can we teach this machine learning algorithm, how to pay attention to particular things in the preceding context. And that, that's what the T stands for, is the ability to not just look at the, what comes next, but looks at what came before and pick the important things about it. And that brings me to another aspect of what ChatGDP is doing. It is all it is doing is predicting what comes next, right? So it is not actually generating some text. It's not looking anything up in a database. It is just generating something that might come next, but it is much more than an autocomplete because that's what often people compare it to these days. It's just a fancy autocomplete. But autocomplete only looks at one, the first, the previous two or three words, and it just pretty much looks at statistical uh, rel rel relationships between those terms, which means if you just keep pushing next, next, next on autocomplete, you will soon get nonsense and it will become circular. Whereas ChatGTP, or rather GPT, the, the transformers allow us to look at very particular things at uh, in the context that precedes it, which then makes much smarter decisions, right? But they're still just prediction decisions. They're not, it doesn't look in grammar, it doesn't look at meaning, it just looks at how are those things before related. And that's what the transformers give us. And that's what the, the T in a way gives us this sort of explosion of capability. And this is, uh, based on the, the third of its kind, GPT-3 is on the hood of ChatGTP. And what the third of its kind gave us is, is massive scale. So going from very modest beginnings that showed really huge potential, scaling it up to GPT-2 that made a bit of a splash about uh, three years ago or th four years ago now. And then GPT-3 that was released at the end of 2020, which all of a sudden released this huge potential, the size of the uh, of the amount of data it created and also training it. It took months to train that model and probably um, hundreds of terabytes of text data and trillions of words. So that I think is the important aspect of it. So this is a huge thing that was enabled by this T, the transformers. And that's what gives us that potential. That's now, uh, that, that's a fantastic explanation of of yeah the the acronym that little T bit has so much so much information in there and so much sort of signposting as to what it actually does but right. that's a really good explanation thank yeah. you 
And the, the, the other aspect of the, of the, the attention of, is all you need is that the, the approaches before were also very promising, but they couldn't compute that much data. They were just so computational intensive because they were trying to do too much. So in a way, this approach is trying, trying to do slightly less in very clever techniques and very complicated ways. So it's not that, that there's, there's so much engineering under the hood, but, but essentially that's gonna allow us to do both a better focus, focus on important things and be more computationally feasible because the context that, Jap that the transformer is looking at when it's training is, is thousands of words, 2,000 up to 8,000 most recently, I think uh, uh, OpenAI was talking about. So those, so, so it looks at these huge contexts and it can sort of, it's computationally feasible because it takes, still takes a lot of time to do. Yeah, uh, cool. Now, now the other, <laughs> the other term is P, which is also really essential. And that's because it's completely transformed what we thought it would take to train an AI model, uh, because that stands for pre-trained. And in the old days, not that old, <laughs> we thought that every time we want to train an AI model, some sort of an agent, a machine learning system, we have to start from scratch, gather loads and loads of data, perform a lot of uh, machine learning on it, which is sort of a very complicated um, statistical analysis of, of, of a sort. And then, and then we have something that does something. And that seemed very daunting. So, okay, well, how could we do it for, um, a particular book or set of books that we have in, in a field. And because sometimes it just seems like for this field, we don't have enough data. Or how do we do it for a very small language that doesn't have a lot of data out on the internet? But it turns out that if you don't start from scratch and just pre-train, that's what the pre-training stands for, a model that with some of these relationships on a huge data set in a very, very sort of a sophisticated way, then that free training then allows you to simply fine tune it for other applications. So for example, you can then take the, the model that ChatGTP has used, uh, has created or GPT has created and, and apply it to other data sets. So for example, there is a website called Bible GPT and it doesn't use ChatGTP, just uses the GPT model, applies it to the Bible and then you can ask questions. <laughs> I want to buy a new bicycle. What does the Bible have to say about it? <laughs> so that's uh, obviously that's a very sort of silly example, but you can essentially, you, you could ask about this agency. I'm thinking about marrying somebody from a different faith, whatever you want to ask that's difficult and it will do a job of a store to apply some of these, some of this, some of these techniques on the Bible. And there have been a few books that have done that where you can ask a book a question about the book and just using that model, it will be able to use, use uh, the fine tuning by that book or by a set of books, by a set of mirrors. And this was for translation. So all of a sudden, ChatGTP or GPT can do translation in multiple languages, even though it was never trained on, on, on translation because it's been pre-trained on so much stuff. And then you can go and fine tune it for other languages and so on. So the, the pre-training is really essential because that means it unlocks the potential of these models for other things. And mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, Stanford uh, started this movement called the foundation models. And that's what, what we now have is these big pre-trained foundation models that then can be used for other things. And there's a few dozen of those. Some of them are open like GPT by OpenAI. Some of them are closed, you know, held close to the West like models and they have Lambda and other models that they use. So, uh, so, so we're kind of, but we now have this opportunity to use these big models like 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 GPT for other things, and that that is the other innovation that kind of comes from that. That's that is that is fascinating. Um, the, the you know we've used a lot of machine learning and algorithmic based based stuff in some of the development of the products that we've made, and I think yeah you know we started some of those programs 10, 15 years ago where it really was much more of the training from the ground up and and trying to get uh trying to get a system to to learn about how students learn was very much from from the ground up so it is a you know we had the we we have the benefit of having started it a lot longer in that kind of traditional model of how ais work as of the exponential growth of, of of the success of the machine learning but this certainly opens up opportunities for new and different ways of of approaching a subject if you have that data set and you want to start to to utilize kind of that that ai model in there um so 
obviously this this sort of chat gpt is 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 in the ether and everyone is is very excited about it um i know that you've been doing a lot of um conversations in and and, and sessions and workshops here within your university about what's the impact what's the what what's going to happen what sort of things have you if you said there what do you what do you think the sort of immediate impact is is on somebody teaching a course this year should they should they be worried should they be excited what what do you think the immediate change is going to be well, i think the the practical change for the teaching part of things is is relatively little at the at, you know this moment this this moment in time um there are many opportunities there are many uh, potentials um uh, and but in a way the future we're kind of open up to the we're open to the future and uh, so many people have already started playing play, playing around with it in different ways. They're, they're incorporating in some of their teaching. Others are just standing by and waiting. And uh, we have yet to see exactly what the what the, the actual impact will be. But one of the few th one of the things that we've discovered is that it can be a useful assistive tool for both students and teachers in in, in useful ways. And um, but the biggest splash that it's made, the, the thing that everybody asks it to do is just can you write an essay for me? Uh, that is one of those things that that people are worried about. But it, it isn't. It is a it is a decent tool for producing essay like content that looks very very essay like. But it isn't that great at writing essays in at, on its own without without a lot of assistance and, and input and checking it across a whole range of areas. In some in some areas in very very short form essays, it will it will produce pretty much ready-made essays. But in, in most areas, particularly if you if you go over a certain amount of length, and I mentioned the the context has greatly increased, but anything that goes beyond about 2,000 words up becomes um, very unstable and unreliable. Uh, so 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 the, the further we go, the less we can rely on on what the content has produced. So I think that's that's the that's the thing. And I've talked to a number of students, and a lot of them have been very sort of disappointed by it as an essay writing tool, right? It did, it turns out it wasn't very, it, it isn't that great. It will do a passable job at something, but it will, uh, people often don't feel like this is, you know, I can probably do a better job. So so as just something, I give it a, an assignment to write an essay about something and it spits out an essay, that, that is probably a lot less useful than it may seem if you just give it a few examples. So over the number of tasks that people may have to do, it will be less useful. But the one thing that people don't realize is that it has lots of assistive potentials and it is much better than we might expect at translating unstructured text into structured text and vice versa. So that, that I think is the one area where people are underestimating the possibilities and where you can actually get the most most use out of it for very practical purposes for both teaching and learning. So can you can you explain a bit more about what you mean by that unstructured into structured text? What does what does that actually mean to somebody who yeah. who might not understand it? Yeah, so 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 the one thing that's um that we're we're dealing with with the system is that is that in a way all it is doing it is taking a an initial context, a prompt and transforms it into a continuation. And if that prompt includes information such as give me a table, it will, will transform it into a sequence of, um, of symbols that then can be shown as a table. And so that's that's what all it is doing. And, uh, and when I've shown this to people, they, they don't realize it can do it and they're very surprised at that. So I can tell, I can say, give me a list of tropical fruits, let's say, for example, right? So uh, it will do a very good job, but give me a list of tropical fruits. And then I, and then I can say, make a table with uh, those fruits, the countries they come from, and their botanical name in, uh, in Latin and their name in the local language, something like that. And it will create all of those things for you. It will it will give you a nice table with all those all that information, and then you can then, then go use use that table for other things, you know, including definitions. You can you can trans you can um, uh, you can create other teaching materials from it. Now, the important information from this is that you can never actually trust that the information it gives you is one hundred percent accurate. But you can. It's a good starting point. So if you were to start yourself, just okay. So here's a list of fruits, and then I have to go make a table, and then and I have to put in all this information. It's a lot more work than being able to check using your knowledge and other sources of information that the information is correct. 
And in some areas, such as tropical fruits, is going to be very, very accurate because, again, because through the process using the transformer uh, approach and the uh, the the relationships it's learned through the uh, through the learning, it's very good at semantic uh, understanding semantic uh, relationships. So it will be able to understand, okay, uh, fruits. This these are fruits, and these are tropical fruits, and they will be able to say these tropical fruits are related to these countries and so on. So that it will be very good at that, and we'll probably get it mostly right, um, you know, and then you give or take. But the minute you ask it for something that isn't as contextually related, such as, for example, calorie contents or sugar amounts, it will give you numbers. You can ask it for that as well. You know, add these to the table. It will give you numbers, but the numbers will be mostly fictitious. <laughs> it will be, it will say something. Okay, these are the kinds of numbers that appear in this context, but they will, they, but they are not the actual numbers. So you have to go there and check those numbers. But most of the I'm finding that sort of country-related things, and uh, these things are very often very accurate, like what's the capital of a country and things like that. And it's not that useful to ask the question because I can Google it quicker and get the, get the accurate answer quicker. But it's useful if I want to want it to ask to tell me, give me a table of those things or or make a list and uh, give me a list and then break the list into five step categories. And again, those are, that immediately gives me that, that nice sort of optionality uh, for me when I'm creating my training materials or my learning materials, flashcards, for example, or whatever it is that I want to do. Yeah, I've seen there's, there's uh, obviously lots of sort of videos on social media and, and other places have sprung up of, of people using, you know, uh, I think I saw some of a school teacher saying, make me a lesson plan on this topic. And it puts it in this lovely lesson plan format and they're going, oh God, this is, you know, this is 90% of what I do is in preparation. And then they actually went in and looked at it and said, okay, it's got some stuff in there, but not all of that information is 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 super is super perfect. Um, I wanted to pick up actually the when you were saying about essays and and sort of you know students being a little bit disappointed. We had we were having a a chat with with somebody who's really dived into using Chat GPT for essay critique. So what they were doing is they asked Chat GPT to write a short essay on a topic and then gave that to the students to go and critique because of the errors that chat gpt would would create in there or the you know the the non not entirely realistic or true or, or or accurate information as a way of trying to encourage that kind of critical thinking and that evaluation skill of not just can you produce this but can you critique what someone else has done and we know that kind of peer to peer learning is 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 very effective but obviously you have to get everyone to create the thing that they're reviewing first and it was quite an interesting move like we're still waiting to see how effective that is but you know being able to use that kind of mass scale production aspect of chat gpt seems to be quite an interesting avenue to to, to look at yes and and that actually is one of the things that is being used so again we have to differentiate the chat GPT yes, versus the GPT. So GPT is that is the model that has a lot of this information. And that is available at the moment as, a, as an application programming interface, API, that other companies can buy from the company open API who made chat GPT and plug it into their products. So if you go uh, and look for AI copywriting tools, you're going to find 20, 30, you know, that it seems to be a new one every day. And there are some of, there's one called Rightful that will uh, that's focused on academic writing. There are many that focus on marketing copy. Uh, that's that's been around for long before Chat GDP, you know, a, a few years. So that's already here. And people are using it to generate content that then needs to be human checked, so to speak. And it was just yesterday at a talk by by Duolingo who, uh, other than just uh, um, making teaching materials, they're also creating language tests. And, and they've used GPT-3 to generate test uh, questions, as in like little, little short essays on different topics that the students can read and give questions about. And what they've discovered, they can make hundreds of them. And then they have human evaluators evaluate whether they're correct or not, whether they're accurate or not, or sort of appropriate. And then they uh, reject maybe 10% of them and then they use the rest. So, or maybe make some slight modifications. So immediately that gives you that sort of that edge on having to do it manually. It's a lot less, lot less expensive. So I think I think if you think of it in those terms as generating these texts and then using so human ability to check them, uh, that you're getting that huge benefit. And also then you can use that. You can use the same thing that you might be using in production with students to help them learn more critical reading skills and and you know research skills and so on. So 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 you can have those two 
one use case that can have two separate uh, avenues in which you can exploit them. You want for producing something that then human, it's called human in the loop, humans correct, or use it with the students as something that they, they, they learn from. And so, so that I think is a very valuable use case that we're already seeing. And again, predates ChatGDP because ChatGDP is just one application on top of this um, of the GPT model, which is the underlying model. Yeah, but I, I confess I, I have used AI copywriting tools for, for a long time. My, uh, my writing style is not perfect for when I'm talking to lots of people at once. So mm -hmm. I'm it's a little too colloquial sometimes. So I've used that sort of AI copywriting to clean up and and, and make my make my language work a little bit more effectively. Um so yeah, it it's I think it's gonna be a really interesting couple of years because you know this this whole thing is still relatively in its infancy for mass scale use and i think everyone's in the either early adopter or early rejector um piles at the moment of they think it's amazing or they think it's it's the worst thing that's that, that's ever happened um what do you actually and on that what would you say to people who are worried about it you know we're, we 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 talked a little bit about essays and plagiarism and i think i think it's it's relatively safe to say that no one is going to be accident no one's going to be cheating their way into a first a first class degree with a with a, a gpt written um essay but for people who are generally worried about it what what do you what would you say to people um like that well i would say in a way have the same uh, same answer to the people who are very enthusiastic about it, as well as to those who are very worried about it. And that is to be very honest about what the system is actually doing under the hood and what it isn't and what it can do and cannot do. And the, the one fundamental misapprehension people have when I talk to them about this, both students and, and academics, is that, that, that when you use GPT or chat GDP, you um, have a database, there's some sort of a database of facts or information like articles or whatever it was trained on that the system looks into and spit and takes and, and spits out data back to you. And that is not what it is doing. And it, it is so fundamental to understand that it, it, it was not what it's designed to do. It is always only predicting, you know, it's that autocomplete thing, but it's a very, very, very sophisticated autocomplete that looks at a, the previous 2000 words, but it is limited in what it's doing. So, so in a way, you can never, both as somebody who's worried that somebody will abuse it and somebody who's thinking, okay, I can use it for everything now, you, you must always have this knowledge in, this sort of in, in the back of your, of your mind saying, it is not actually looking things up. And we can see it as, as kind of a uh, um, so, so a good example of this is, is Microsoft's Bing chat, which was just released. So, so Microsoft has been working with OpenAI, the makers of ChatGDP for a while. And they said, okay, let's integrate this underlying technology and the, the ideas and some of that, some of the, the, some of the language modeling into our search um, in, uh, in Bing. Now you can sign up for it. And after a while, they will, they will give you as a, a preview access to it. So I've had this for a week now. And I was testing it along with ChatGDP and what Bing is saying, okay, we can overcome this limitation of ChatGDP of not having any knowledge and plug it into searches. But it turns out it actually isn't all that great outside of a very limited domain because it, again, it's only predicting, it's never looking things up. So I gave it uh, a very simple task. Give me some Czech proverbs uh, around about animals or Czech idioms about animals. And it, and, and it did that. And unlike ChatGTP, it gave me links to where it found that information. In, there's no nice little footnotes. I was thinking, well, this is what a transformative experience. Except the proverbs it found for me, one of them was something like a blue elephant in a pocket is, <laughs> is, is bad for your health. I cannot remember what it is. So something with blue elephant in it. And I said, okay, well, I've, I've never heard of that Czech proverb, but may, maybe, there's, may, you know, maybe there's one I never heard of, or somebody's giving misinformation on the internet about Czech proverbs. So I clicked on those links, and there were five links it gave me, and none of the three proverbs were on any of the links. The, the words that they they was using were on the links, but the proverbs were not. So it, it, it gave me helpful links, but didn't give me the right information from the links. So again, the trustworthiness is very limited. And just this morning, I was, I was asking it, give me some suggestions about flights. Uh, I'm going, I just told it, I'm going to a conference at Harvard. And I'm thinking about coming a week early and exploring the neighborhood. Give me some ideas for itineraries and flights. 
And it very correctly knew that Harvard is at Boston, so it told me the flights to Boston. And I was also told that, that, that I live in London, that I wouldn't go from London. But for some, some reason, in the first part of the conversation, was telling me flights from London, UK. And then one of the flights randomly was from London, Canada, <laughs> where there's also lots of Londons around America. So, so all of a sudden, it can lose, make some of, the, some of these mistakes, even though it has access to the surge. Because, and I, I only noticed it because it was telling me the average, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the cost of the flight was too low. And it also, for somehow, it gave me, including a link, the average cost of a hotel in Boston is $15 a night. So, so it was telling me this very confidently, this information with links where I could go verify it. So I at least know where to go verify it, but, but it wasn't passing that very basic smell test. So anything that has to do, so, so even though searches are involved in it, and they're, but all it is doing is fine tuning that result, but it's always just predicting the next thing. It's never looking things up. And, and that is very important to know about ChatGDP as well. So even if I give it a text to correct, if the text is sufficiently short, up to about a thousand words, it will actually correct it quite nicely. But the moment you go very long, like the maximum you can paste into ChatGDP itself is 2000 words, which is the maximum context it can use. Uh, it, will, uh, it will start forgetting what's at the beginning of the text in inability to use it. So I gave it a long text about 2000 words and I asked, give me a list of all the people mentioned in the in the article and what the article says about them. And then it, it did a few and then it started and it started inventing people who were not in the article, but who might have been in that sort of article. So it wasn't completely <laughs> off the wall, but they were not there just because because the context includes that entire interaction. So the, the minute it produces the first word, it, it sees less of the context. So it's not, it doesn't actually look things up. It's only predicting based on what the context is. And the longer the context is, the less reliable that becomes. So the more kind of inventive it becomes. So that's one of those issues that it's very powerful at generating structured data from unstructured data, but it isn't uh, it isn't very accurate the more you try to you ask it to do. So for very sm small samples, it's much better. And and vice versa, it also, you can give it, a, you know, like a lot of bullet points and say, write me, uh, uh, you write me some prose about it. And it was, it's, good, it's very good at, at doing it. But again, the more data is, there is, the less likely it is to be comprehensive. But it's it's a good way of sort of, of, of as a tool for checking between things. But it, it has these limitations. And the fundamental limitation, it is it does it has no copy and paste functionality. It is always just this is a context, and given that context, what might I say next? And that's the, and that, and it's bizarre how much it can do just with, with that very simple algorithm. But that's all that algorithm is doing, and it's just so deceptive because it's so good at it, but it's so easy to trust it too much. Yeah, I think I think you you are. It was a. It was very good to actually explain that in because yeah, most most people experience that where they where they ask a they, they ask a simple question or they ask something to do and it just happens. But actually getting that deep understanding of what it's actually doing is 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 fundamental. I mean, I saw you know we we're, we're getting bombarded at the moment with every marketing company or marketing team at every company is putting out things of how to use Jack chat gpt to do xyz um and i had some i had some outreach from a from a, a recruiter the other day like god one one who i signed up to when i was you know 18 19 because thinking you know I, I, i'll need this at some point and they had sent through how to use chat gpt to create your cover letter for your cv and it was you know it was take the take the job description and put that in and then take your CV and put that in and then take the, take the homepage or the mission statement of the company and put that in and ask it to write you a cover letter. And I thought, I looked at that and I went, Oh my God, that, that sounds, that sounds amazing. That's that, you know, I spent hours and hours and hours and students spent so long you know, panicking about their cover letter and all of that. I tried doing it with one of my old CVs and um, it made me sound not brilliant all things considered it you know it, it it said you know of my key you know key skills and things can talk which i thought was was slightly underselling me a little bit but it's you know it's understanding those limitations of it's trying to predict what would come next from yeah. from this and it was i think it's just a really interesting space to experiment at the moment yes and, and again as long as you know that's what it, all it is doing then you can you can sort of make advantage take advantage of it so i've used it I wrote uh, th this article about four lessons about ChatGDP, and the fourth lesson, somebody said it, it's very complicated, very wordy. So I, I gave it to ChatGDP. Can you make this simpler? Uh, 
And it gave me four different answers. And I, because I asked it four different times and I didn't use any of them. But the process of seeing that rephrasing from different perspective, all of a sudden unlocked the potential in my head to do it correctly. So it's it's very useful for brainstorming. And that's where I use it the most is if I, if I get stuck, I, I, I ask for suggestions um, in any way and then, then I use it. I've actually never used the output as is, um, even though I would be happy to. It's not because I have some objections to doing that, but I've just never had that output in quite the right way because I found it useful. But I know other people use it in the way you already suggested. They will put in the sort of slightly informally worded uh, thing and then have it ask it to convert it into a different into a different style. And it is amazingly good at that, both at reasonably good at translation, but also good at uh, translation between styles and genres or the writing style of somebody else. But also, you again, you have to remember, it's never, doesn't have any uh, fact-checking uh, facility. So you always have to check that it hasn't made something different by, by mistake, because that can happen. The, long, the longer the text is, the more likely it is, that is to happen. So that's, that's one of those things that you're always going to have to check all, all, those, all those bits that it, that it spits out. I think it's like with, with any with any piece of technology, the the you know you always still have to do that mm -hmm. that trust check um, moment within it, and I think it's going to be quite a long time before it gets to it gets to the point where you can innately trust it in the same way as any other technology that gets introduced when when there's when there's computation that happens somewhere else, it takes a while to to feel comfortable with it. I think. Well, and, and I think that's also important. The other questions you ask what is the long-term impact and is the answer is that we just don't know we're at a stage right now where something quite transformative unexpected happened it, it wasn't quite in december when chat gtp was released it, that it was a bit earlier when gpt3 was released and as people started discovering it uh, but the world has found out about it last december when when open ai released chat gtp uh and uh, we don't know what the next step is. So people have very mixed uh, uh, questions about the GPT-4 that's so supposedly going to be released this year. Is that going to be another massive step or is it gonna be a relatively small step? And, and what will that mean? Because it's, they're still using that same under the hood computation, but will they use more data? Will they use more computation? What are all those things um, happening? And there's this research that, is at the moment asking the question, and one researcher is suggesting we would need much more data than there is available in the quality that we use to get much better at using the current systems. Now we also know that, that GPT actually isn't perhaps the best use case of transformers. It's not, not the most advanced ways to use them. It's kind of a brute force approach. So we don't we just don't know what's going to happen in the future in terms of the trustworthiness. You know, is it actually going to be possible to develop a trustworthy uh, trustworthy sort of a, a system into like like some sort of a fact checking uh, in the loop aspect, and the reason we had high hopes, I had high hopes for the Bing <laughs> uh, approach, and it it just turns out very few examples, completely unreliable uh, for me at least, and and I think that that means that it can be unreliable in quite significant ways, not just a small mistake. Now, the one thing that, however, we have built into ChatGPT that people also don't realize is that we have um, the ability to write not only structured things in terms of tables and lists, but also software. And so that I think is the other underappreciated aspect of ChatGTP. So I said, it's really hard to, for example, compare the outputs to, to other things, but it isn't hard to ask it to write software to do it. So I was comparing a bunch of translations that I was testing to see how, what the different translations are. And I, this was very tedious because I was sort of looking, what are the differences? So I asked it, can you write a little, little piece of JavaScript uh, that, I, that I can paste into a web page, including a form where I can paste two bits of text and to highlight the words that are different? And it did it. It took a few iterations. So, so that's one of the powers of ChatGPT. back and say, you know what, this didn't quite work. Can you fix it? And I have to know enough what it means to you know, copy a bit of code into a file and make it into, open it into, in a browser. But now I have this little tool that can compare any two paragraphs <laughs> and to see if they're the same or not. You know, so, so that's that's a very useful thing. Another another test that I was doing, I was, I was giving it a task, give me uh, a table of cities uh, of European capitals with their distances from Prague. 
uh, just uh, it was I didn't need it for anything. I was just going to random, ra random thing. And then I also say, give me uh, the populations of those cities as well in the table for good measures. I did all of that very beautifully, except of course those numbers were made up. You cannot trust any of those numbers. They're directionally correct, so it's by and large correct, but. Uh, it has no common sense, so it cannot. That, for example, it had Vatican and Rome 200 kilometers <laughs> apart from each other, so that that obviously mm. makes no sense. And but then I could then I ask it, can you write me a query for Mathematica, which is the the system that uses Wolfram Alpha, that will do the search and look up that information? And it did, and then I was able to get that table with the correct information from that. But if I had to myself write that whole query, it would be much more complicated. So all of a sudden, I had that sort of some of the fact checking built in. So for some structured queries, I have this potential uh, to to get that fact checking. But the, what it doesn't, what that doesn't do, is doesn't fact check that are those actually European capitals? Are they all of them? And it turns out when I asked ChatGDP to do that same task five different times it gave me five different lists. So they were very similar, but sometimes Vatican was there, sometimes it wasn't there. Sometimes uh, sometimes you had uh, Luxembourg City there, sometimes you didn't. So, so it was the major ones were there, but I wasn't. I could never be sure is that the complete list of capitals. And so, so those are some of the things that you still have to do, have sort of human knowledge in the loop, but, but that, that, is a, uh, that is something people shouldn't forget. Use it not just to not just to generate these sort of blobs of text, but also structured software that can then help you use um, use the rest of the internet to check things in a in a more structured way. That is absolutely fascinating. The the that kind of secondary usage. I think once you get over that um, initial, oh my god, it can write me a story about something uh, mentality of. How do I actually put this to use? You know, if you've got no real knowledge of of coding or software creation or things like that, to be able to get something to give you bare bones structure, you know, yes, you might need some tweaking and some playing around. But you know, if you're developing, if you've got students developing a a website or or you're asking them to go and create a, a you know a small piece of software or something like that to to help them demonstrate what they're doing i think it's um it's a really fascinating tool um, and and you as publishers and of course teachers themselves so one of the things i asked it to do is it's very good at generating comprehension questions about texts mm -hmm. so i gave it a bit of i gave an english text from the bbc website that have these nice little uh intermediate level english texts and i said give me five comprehension tech questions one of them wasn't wasn't actually accurate <laughs> regarding the text but four of them were and then I said okay that's very nice so make me now a little JavaScript interactive quiz that I could put on the internet for students to test their comprehension so you just click a b c or c or d and it will do you correct or incorrect and it did that so again it gave me you know as a teacher all of a sudden I have this little tool to give students more interactivity in their learning so that's that's another example that it can be used for uh, uh, by you know by multiple people in a way that previously would have been outside of their you'd have to look for specialized expensive tools but now you can just put up a little html page that is that is is fascinating i, I think we'll certainly have to um we'll have to get a showcase of some of the stuff that you've done at some point um unfortunately we are we are out of time at this point so i'd just like to say Thank you so much for for talking to us about this. Um, I have certainly learned a huge amount from uh, from this. Uh, I'm I'm very I'm sure people will be very jealous of your colleagues who get to uh, come to your workshops and and and, and learn from you on this. Um, and we will certainly be keeping tabs on um, on how this progresses, and we'll probably get you back in at some point because you clearly know an awful lot more than than I do, and most people do as as well. So. Um, Thank you again um, for, for, for taking part in this and yeah, we'll have to get you back on soon. Well, thank you. And uh, everybody enjoy your experiments with uh, this new dawn of uh, new tools. That's all we have time for today. Thanks to my guests for sharing their perspectives with us and for giving us an insight into their world. If you'd like to learn more about what McGraw-Hill can do for you, please visit mheducation.co.uk. Links are all in the show notes. If you've got something to say and would like to get involved in an episode of Blended, please get in touch with us too. Until next time, I've been Wes, and this was Blended.